All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aaron Parecki. Um, we were talking about OAuth and IndieAuth and um, doing a sort of overview and also doing a protocol level quick version of the protocol. So um, get ready to have a little bit of code on the screen. Hopefully not too bad for people. A um, little bit of bookkeeping up front. I wanted to let everybody know about a couple of uh, back channels for discussion or notes about the session. Um, there's the Indie Web Camp channel on freenode.net, which has a few people who are watching, um, watching tweets and uh, IRC chatter and stuff like that. So join there if you want to chat about this stuff. Um, there's an etherpad for taking live notes uh, on uh, mozilla.org, and the hashtag is IndieAuth. So back in uh, the old days of Twitter, when it used to look like this, it was kind of a fun time. It was, um, you know, you go on there, make an account, and you would microblog. People called it microblogging. We don't, we don't really hear about that much anymore with Twitter. Um, but you had a sort of sense of ownership over your Twitter account. You know, it was your place to put these notes that didn't, they were too short for your blog, so you needed a place for them. Um, and the really interesting thing that happened with, with Twitter was that this app ecosystem formed. And because they had an API from the very beginning, um, it was possible to write apps that would both let you write tweets and also read them. And what ended up happening was we just saw this huge explosion of Twitter apps that were able to create and consume content from the network. This is just the first like 10, the rest of them fell off the screen. Um, and even the Twitter web interface was you know, encouraging this by, if you look at the, on the timestamp line, it even tells you which app was used to post that note. So as you're reading Twitter, you could see someone posting from an app you never heard of and click on the link and it was like, oh cool, they're using that app, I should go try that. And it led to this really nice um, ecosystem of all these different apps that were out there. Some of the apps were things like um, would pull in your Twitter history and give you a nice little visualization of how you use Twitter. This one was showing like um, day of the week, hour of the day breakdowns of how much you, you tweeted. Before the Twitter API was very well formed, it actually, before OAuth, it was just using username and password auth. And that, of course, was a huge problem. We're well beyond that stage now, but just to sort of set the context here. You know, you'd see stuff like this all the time where it was like, oh yeah, post this tweet and you'll get this free download thing. And in order to post the tweet, you'd have to enter your Twitter username and password. And nobody does that today anymore with Twitter because Twitter and Facebook have done a good job of pushing the, the experience of OAuth. But this was a problem. And the solution was, okay, we need a way to let people post to their Twitter accounts without asking for their passwords. And... Um, yeah, otherwise you end up giving your username and password to random apps which might be storing it, probably in plain text because they're going to have to use it in plain text to authenticate with Twitter. Um, and the, of course the problem with that is once you give out your password, then the app can do anything that you can do with your account, including like changing your password. Um, and there was no way to revoke access to apps other than changing your password, which would invalidate the, the previous one. And this happens all the time. Services get broken into and um, the password database is sucked down, and then all of a sudden, your password's out there. So, thankfully, this was pretty obvious that it was a problem. And uh, a lot of companies jumped on board and said, okay, we're going to solve this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be OAuth. Uh, we're going to standardize the way we do this. And that went through um, a number of iterations. OAuth 1 is the, uh, the first official... Um, First official agreeing upon version of how this works, and that's the one that Twitter implemented. It's they've still implemented that one. Flickr also implemented OAuth one, and there's been a lot of revisions to it since then. And most of the providers now are implementing OAuth two. And there's an important difference between the two, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. So now here we are in 2014, and we know what Twitter looks like. We know what OAuth looks like. We know what Facebook looks like. Um, people still blog, and more and more people are trying to use their own websites for things that aren't quite full-on blogging, more like posting to Twitter. So I'll show you a bunch of examples. This is 
my website. I'm, I post short tweet size notes and I post photos that I would post on Instagram, that, or I do post on Instagram as well. And I even get comments and likes showing up on my site. So it, it's an experience that's very similar to what we see in Twitter. There's a whole bunch of people doing this now. This is um, Ben Word. He's, his site, Word.io, is powered by software called Known. Known is um, a social network app for your own website. Um, and again, he's got comments and, and likes. There's Brett, which is, who's doing this with um, Jekyll, just a static site generator. There's um, some Python implementations. There's you know, uh, Taproot, which is on the PHP implementation. But the point is that people really like having this experience of posting short content. But we should be able to do that on our own websites rather than having to use Twitter. And um, the way that most people are doing this right now is very much like the, the way this worked posting to a blog, where your posting interface is integrated into your own website. So let's say I'm making my own website, and I'm, it's a simple PHP site, and I make a little username and password login screen, and then the first thing I do is I make a form that says, all right, I'm going to post a note. Um, you know, we see this in WordPress. You log into your WordPress site, you have an interface for writing a post. Um, this is what happens when, you, when I'm logged into my site. I see a little thing up at the top that looks like the old Twitter prompt. I kind of liked having it in line there. Um, but you know, I had to make that interface. Um, this is the alternate interface I use to, to write content, which helps me with a little bit more of the formatting and make the shortened Twitter version that gets syndicated out to Twitter. Um, here's Ben's interface, um, known, where, again, it's, it's part of his website where he can post right from there. And um, here's, here's Red Wind. It, again, you can kind of see they're all very similar, right? They all have like the text box to type into. They might have some metadata like location, a list for tags. Um, they all have a publish button. And the, the point is we're limited by this right now because every, every time I want to post something new, like a photo, then I'm going to have to go build an interface into my own website. And that gets boring really fast. I don't really like making interfaces, honestly. I'm not really a front-end web developer. I'm a back-end web developer. And I don't want to have to make an interface for everything I want to post on my site. So why not post to my site from other apps? We saw this worked really well with Twitter. Why can't it work with our own websites? So this is a, a sample app that I made to sort of proof of concept this. Um, when you, when you go to the site here, it asks you to sign in. And it asks you to sign in with your domain name. The idea being that you don't need a separate account with this app. There's no reason for it to have a database of users and keep a password. Just sign in with your domain name. When you sign in, it's going to go through a little checklist. And this is mostly just for um, debugging purposes so that as people are implementing this on their sites, they can get a nice little to-do list instead of uh, just weird error messages. Once you're signed in, you get a pretty simple, uh, straightforward form. Um, place for entering the note, tags. Um, it, it actually does browser location, so it'll include the location of where you are in the post. And when you hit the post button, it goes and talks to your website, creates a post, and there you are. No, no account needed. And there's a few of these now. So this is um, Barnaby's interface called uh, Taproot. And this is, it's, it was just, it started as his own interface that he was using to post to his site. And he was able to very quickly extend it to be able to post to anybody's website. So anybody can go and sign into his interface now and create a note. Where it starts to get really interesting is when you're talking about things that aren't just plain text. Because plain text is not that hard to make an interface for. Although you would be surprised because every time you want to like shorten the text to syndicate to Twitter to fit in 140 characters, there are hoops you have to go through to make it work well so that it looks good. Um, so this is an example I, I made which every time I post a photo to Instagram, this app will actually go and post the photo to my website as well. So it's basically like cloning my photos over to my site so I can keep them on my own website. Um, but I made this as a demonstration of not, not just text. So it's actually going to go and send a, you know, a photo object in the post request to your site. 
And um, why, why does it just have to be a website? Why can't it also maybe be a browser extension? So if you're on somebody else's site and you see a thing you want to reply to, you can just click your browser button and write a message right there. This is actually a screenshot from Known. So that's where I would like to get to. So how does, how does this end up working? First, I'm going to set down a couple of constraints that we're working within, just to sort of set the stage here. I want to reinvent as little as possible, so use as much existing work as possible. We have seen that HTTPS is easier than people figuring out cryptography. And um, where this came from is OAuth 1 relied on um, the crypto in the protocol. So you would sign requests and you would have shared secrets that you would use to be able to verify requests. And it works great and you can transmit over a HTTP connection with no encryption because everything is all signed. But the problem is that it just annoys the crap out of people building stuff on both ends of the spectrum. It's hard enough to deal with as a consumer of this, but a lot harder to deal with as building an API to support this. And there, there was a lot of discussion about this in the whole OAuth working group and OAuth 2.0 decided to just rely on HTTPS and drop the crypto out of the core protocol. Um, basically just let HTTPS, the transport layer, let that do the encryption. That's what it's there for. So another, another constraint, HTML and form encoded requests and responses. So every, I'm sure everybody here uses XML APIs all the time, right? No, but you did 10 years ago. So right now everybody uses JSON APIs. Will we keep using J JSON APIs in 10 years? I don't know, but HTML is gonna be there. It's not going away. Another very useful constraint is that users are represented by URLs and so are apps. And I'll get into why this is important when we start going through the flows. Of course, you might be saying, what about native apps? Well, in order for this to work with native apps, they need some sort of public URL that is at least an about page. So um, put this all together and you have IndieAuth, which is essentially OAuth 2.0 plus a web identity layer. So most of this is based on OAuth 2, and where OAuth 2 leaves things that are sort of dangling, which is the core spec leaves a lot of um, empty, a lot of holes where you have to go and fill things in with your own, make your own decisions. Anytime those have come up, I've added basically this idea of web identity where things are URLs, and that is, that is any auth. So I'm going to go through an example of signing in to a website, which is essentially just indie auth for identification only. So if you go to the uh, indie web camp wiki, this is basically how this works. You go to the wiki and um, you sign in, you identify yourself by your URL. So in OAuth terminology, you have um, the app is identifi identified by a client ID and a redirect URI. So the client ID is typically you, you like go to Twitter, you make your Twitter app, it gives you some random string for your client ID. So one of the constraints that, that I lay down is apps are URLs. So now you don't need to register them with anything because they're already registered by being on the internet. Um, and the other key advantage this gives us is um, one, of the, one of the security considerations is of course um, register redirect your eyes so that you can't have, um, this was actually an attack that was demonstrated a couple months ago. Um, what is it called? Uh, covert redirect. You can search for that and find all sorts of press articles about how OAuth is super broken, right, right after Heartbleed. Um, but in reality, w what that was was just some services didn't require you to register or redirect your eyes, so you could just sort of attack people by redirecting them to other places. So registering redirect your eyes. But instead of like going into some you know, Twitter developer console or Facebook developer console and putting in your list, you just put them on the web page and register them there. Um, so the user, this is the identity layer added to OAuth 2 by IndieAuth. And then I've chosen to, I've chosen to use this IndieAuth.com authorization server. And that's a decision that the user makes by putting, by delegating to that from their website. So here's my website. If you look at the source code, you will somewhere in there see um, a link tag with 
rel equals authorization endpoint and a link to indieauth.com. So basically, um, as a user, I get to choose which authorization server to use, and I can point to indieauth.com, or I can write my own, or whatever. I talked about registering the redirect URI, so the app has to have a web page, and the app has to register its redirect URI by putting a tag in the page that says, here are one or more URIs that are valid. And now um, consumers can verify that they're not sending the users to uh, attackers redirect URI. So the sign in forms and looks something like this. It's going to have a place to enter your domain name. When the user clicks sign in, basically the, the wiki in this case has to go and um, discover the user's authorization endpoint and then redirect the browser there using all the OAuth parameters that are already well documented in the OAuth 2 spec. So I'm going to show you uh, what those look like. So we're going to build up the, the authorization URL here, starting with my authorization endpoint. We'll add my website that I just typed in in that form. We'll add the client ID, which is the, the wiki knows its own client ID. It also knows its redirect URI, which is where the which is where when I'm signing in, I'll be taken back to that redirect URI after I'm signed in. Um, state, which is a arbitrary string that's used by the by the wiki in this case to um, maintain session session data or maintain um, uh, link up link up the request so that when it comes back it can match it up. Um, it's it's also there for um, security so you can prevent cross site attacks. Um, so I'm sitting at my computer. I get redirected to this auth URL. This is what I see on the screen. And I see okay, I'm authenticating as AaronParky.com, and this is where I prove to IndieAuth.com that I am who I say I am. I might use the Google Authenticator app or my email or any of the other mechanisms that are supported. And after the authorization server agrees that I am me, it will send me my browser back to the redirect URL. So the authorization server has to build up the redirect URL with all the information about the request again. So I'm going to build this one up piece by piece, starting with the redirect URL adding an authorization code, which is um, used to verify this request later. And then again, that state parameter is just passed through directly by the authorization server. And it has the identifier of who signed in. At this point, the wiki is like, okay, great. I see that somebody is signing in. I need to verify that uh, this request is valid. So it can go and query my authorization endpoint with that code, and the authorization server responds with, yes, this is AaronParky.com. At that point, the user is signed in. So this was this is basically um, the first half of OAuth 2. So I'm going to go through that again in a different context. In this case, so, so in the first example, I just need to identify myself as AaronParky.com. Signing into the wiki because I need to see protected content or make an edit um, to the wiki. So all that it needs to know is, is this person, AaronParky.com. Now, I talked about this sort of app ecosystem where we can have apps posting to your own website. So this is an example of uh, apps posting to my website. So in this case, I'm going to sign into a notes app, and I'm going to I'm going to end up um, authorizing it to be able to create content on my site. So this is now like pretty sensitive because I'm opening up a way for an application to create posts as me, as if it were me. So this is any author authorization. So I'll use this uh, this Quill example. Um, this is a this is you know a third party app, not made by me, um, hypothetically. <laughs> it needs to be able to get authorization from my website to be able to create content on my site. The end result is that it's going to be making a post request to my site, and my site's going to say, OK, cool. I'm going to publish this note. I might syndicate it to Twitter. I might tell a bunch of people about it, whatever. Like, it's, it's as if I had written it. So we have a client ID and redirect URI again. And they're going to be different in this case, a different app. Um, and this quill.p3k.io, you can actually go there and do this if you want to try it out. Um, you'll probably get stuck pretty quick because you don't have the tag set up, but at least I'll tell you what to add. Um, there's going to be the user again, me, and 
Now, instead of just delegating to an authoriz authorization endpoint, I now need to be able to issue access tokens, and I need an endpoint that the app can use to create posts. So adding here the token endpoint and the micropub endpoint. So if you notice, the domains of these endpoints are all different. And I did that in order to point out that you can implement all or none of these yourself, and it will work. All of these could be on AaronParky.com if I wanted to go and build them all myself. And I honestly don't. I would rather build it once and have it work for a bunch of different sites. So in order to declare these endpoints that are part of my site, I, again, edit my source code on AaronParky.com. I add in these two new link tags, one to point to a token endpoint and one to point to the microbot endpoint. Uh, the Quill app has to register its redirect URL on its web page, so it adds a tag there. And now, when I hit the sign-in form, I'm going to type in AaronParky.com. This app is going to look for those three tags and then attempt to get authorization from me. So first thing it's going to do is it's going to find that indieauth.com slash auth is my authorization server, and it's going to build up this authorization URL. So it'll put my URL, it'll put its client ID, its redirect URI, it'll have a state parameter. And a new thing here is scope. Now this is, this is part of the OAuth spec. This is what, what sort of scope is this request valid for? And it wasn't in the first one because we just needed to worry about identification. But in, in this context, um, the app is requesting to be able to post to my site, so it's going to ask for the post scope. Now when, I, when I'm looking at my computer and I see the authorization request, it's going to look a little bit different. Instead of saying it's requesting to, requesting to sign in, it's saying allow Quill access to AaronParky.com, and it's requesting uh, the post scope. So if I think this request checks out, and uh, it's what I expected to see, I'll go ahead and sign in, at which point it's going to generate an authorization code, which is exactly the same as before. And it's going to send um, me back to Quill with that authorization code. So apologies if this is a little bit too down in the depths, but at this point, Quill has this authorization code. Rather than just using it to check who I am, it now needs to actually get an access token for my site. So it's going to go and say, hey, AaronParky.com, where can I get access tokens? And I said, oh, you can go here to get them. So it's going to post the authorization code and all the information about the request to my token endpoint. And the key here is that, that code with all the Xs. That's the code that it was just uh, issued in the previous step. If my token endpoint agrees, it will go ahead and issue an access token. So previously, the request just had a response of me is AaronParky.com. But now the response has an access token and scope. The assumption is that uh, when Quill goes and makes this request to get this access token, um, it can store that and then use that access token against my website to create posts. And then the user signed in, and I've issued an access token to the app. Um, now, so this is all basically just straight, straight up OAuth 2. Um, the, really the only thing that's different that is added on is the idea that there's this me parameter being passed around of who the user is, as well as the, um, the endpoints are all being discovered over HTTP and HTML, rather than being registered with a developer site. And interesting point here, I put the authorization server and the token endpoint on different domains to make this point. When the token endpoint is about to issue an access token, it needs to go and verify that code. But that code may be issued by something that's not it. So it has to have a way to verify that authorization code. So basically, the token endpoint can go and query the authorization server saying, hey, is this a valid code? And if so, grant the access token. Now, in most OAuth2 implementations that you'll see, they're the same server. And they can do this sort of behind the scenes in the data, because they share a database or something like that, and they have a common backend. But in this case, I want to be able to have these two things be completely separate, so they have to be able to verify it over HTTP. 
um, if you actually want to go and try this, you um, you can use the, the quill.b3k.io site to test, and it'll walk you through setting up the tags and setting up each step. And the neat thing is that because of the separation of authorization server token endpoint and micro endpoint, you can actually jump straight to building the micro endpoint in your website and just use the two services that I've set up temporarily until you want to build your own token endpoint. So I set up the token endpoint because it's easier to not build it, especially if you're just starting out and you're confused about what the heck is going on. Um, there's lots of docs on the token endpoint at that URL, uh, indiewebcamp.com slash token endpoint. Okay, so we went through the authorization process in two different flows. Um, the, at the end of the uh, authorization process, the Quill app was granted an access token from my website. It's got this big long string and it's ready to go and use it. It's going to say, okay, I'm going to go make a post on AaronParky.com. So now imagine this is, this is AaronParky.com or it's your own website and um, your, your, let's say it's a, you know, a simple PHP site and you just have files on disk that are the posts and you want to be able to have an API endpoint that will create a file that is a post. So you're going to end up getting a, an HTTP request from who knows who, and you have to be able to verify that that request it came from an app you authorized. So you're going to get an access token. You need to be able to verify them. So again, we have this HTTP verification where you can, your website can say, okay, here's this token. Is this valid? You can go and check your token endpoint, ask your token endpoint, hey, is this token valid? And they'll say yes or no. So actually creating the post. So that was authorization. Now, now let's dive into your in your own website. Probably, I hope at least half of you guys have your own website. Um, and chances are you all have a different language and server-side environment from each other. And you probably don't all agree on a lot of decisions about this, how this should work. And that's great. That's fine. So. This is supposed to be the bare minimum that you have to have in common in order for this stuff to work. So Micropub is a vocabulary for creating and editing posts on your site. It's based on Microformats 2, which is uh, a markup for expressing objects in HTML. Authentication for Micropub is handled by OAuth2 bearer tokens. Now, most of the time you're gonna end up obtaining these tokens from an indie auth authorization but you don't even have to do that. If you want to make your own username and password login box on your website and issue yourself access tokens that way, you can. They're totally separate issues. Microbe also uses form encoded requests. The advantage being that you can make an HTML form that posts directly to your microbe endpoint. Go ma imagine that. Like, you don't even need to write any code for that. Um, typically, your micro endpoint is going to live within your website or CMS. Um, but, and, and yeah, it knows how to create posts on your site, but if you have a static site, obviously you can't run any code on your static site. So how can you support it? Well, again, that's why this micro endpoint is delegated to from your homepage, because um, if, if you have a static site, it can't be its own micro endpoint. So you can go and say, hey, thing over here, you know how to commit into my Git repository and push, so you're my... my micro endpoint. And uh, Brett has made an example of that on, I hope I got that right, is that you get pub .com? Temporary, yeah. yeah, it's temporarily running there. It'll hopefully launch somewhere. But basically that's a micro endpoint that knows how to commit into a Git repo and push up to a static site to trigger the generation. So shooting for, again, bare minimum here so that people who want a full Rails stack, or want a simple PHP site, or want a static site, can all use this because of the way things are uh, completely separate. So here's what a MicroPub request looks like. It's pretty simple. So my MicroPub endpoint that I pointed to is this. The request is gonna come in with this access token in a header, and the payload is going to look like this. It's gonna say h equals entry, which is the object uh, entry, and then the content of the post will be in a parameter called content. This is the basically 
hello world of Micropub. It's the smallest, most simple thing you can do. If you send this request to my endpoint with a valid access token, it will create a new note dated today, or right now, that says hello world, and it'll show up on my site. After my endpoint um, creates that post, it's going to respond with 201 created and a location header indicating the URL that it just created. The neat trick about that here is, again, let's assume simplest possible example. You have your, your uh, staring at an HTML form and you have a field called content and a hidden field called H and you have a submit button. If you submit it, well, your browser is going to send a post request. And what happens with the response? Well, if it has a location header, your browser is going to get taken to that URL. So what's the end user experience here? You submit the form, you see the post. It's pretty straightforward. And it requires very little additional work on your part because this stuff that's all built into browsers already in HTTP. Maybe you also return short links for posts. You can ex return extended info by adding HTTP headers. But what if you want to create other types of content? Text notes are interesting. Obviously, Twitter showed us that they are very powerful. But Instagram is pretty cool, too. I like posting photos. Or maybe I want to include location with a, a post. We'll say, just include, yeah, I'm in Portland, or I'm at this venue. Um, well, we can start adding fields. And you can represent a location as a latitude and longitude. There's already a geo URI spec for that. Um, and um, yeah, so in, in Quill, when, when you are writing a note and hit the Find Me button, it'll go and use the browser geolocation API, find the lat long, and then it'll include that in the post request as well. Photos are interesting. Um, of course, dealing with binary data is a challenge with APIs usually, but it turns out this problem has been solved. And it's been solved by multi-part encoding. And you basically don't even have to know what this looks like because it's so solved that it's part of most web stacks. They just sort of do it for you. Like in PHP, you get a request and it just sort of automatically shows up in the files array. And then all the form fields show up in the post array. What it actually looks like under the hood is you end up with um, this, this payload where your individual, what used to be very small parameters, get broken out into separate chunks. So you have your h equals entry and content equals blah, and I threw some emoji in there because why not? And then the file is the next chunk. And it says um, the content type is a JPEG, and the file name is photo.jpg. And then it'll you know, be 100k of junk down below that. But the nice thing is that I didn't have to make up a encoding scheme to send files through Micropub. Like it's already there. It's called HTTP. So why former coded and multipart? Why not JSON? Again, trying to reinvent as little as possible. These things are already there and they work pretty well. Um, pretty much every server-side environment whether, what, where, regardless of the language, it's implemented this at some point because it's been in HTTP so long. So it'll just sort of be handled by your environment automatically. Um, provides a method of attaching files or other things that aren't photos. Um, you can have other content types, you can have other file names, um, things that I haven't thought of. Um, so what, what next? Well. We've got text and photos, pretty well solved. There's some apps that show us how to do those, Twitter, Instagram. What about things that aren't just text and photos, like sleep data or weight data or other quantified self-trackers? Um, this is a screenshot of my website. You can see how much I slept last night. It's aaronperky.com slash metrics. Um, that's tracked by this Jawbone band. And then right now, because Jawbone doesn't know about Micropub, I have to go and sort of pull it in myself. Um, when I step on the scale at home, it's sending it to the WeThings API, but at the same time, it also goes and copies it to my site. Ideally, these things, it would be normal for these things to be able to post to your own data store for them. 
And maybe you can throw in all sorts of different devices into this ecosystem. Maybe it's not just apps that you're using on your phone that are creating content on your site. Maybe it's also, yeah, your scale. Maybe it's the home, you know, sensors at home or your light bulbs. And then that's getting data in. What about getting data out? Well, if you have all your data that's in your website and hopefully, you know, pr probably you want some of that to be private. Um, I don't mind having my sleep data public, but I don't want my actual, like, all of my location logs and trails to be public. But I might want an app to be able to access some of that data and analyze it. So we have this pattern, it's, it's OAuth and scopes. So these different capabilities that this app is requesting basically cor correspond to scopes. So maybe that's, you know, scope equals bedroom dash audio or scope equals bedroom dash air quality. And when an app is trying to identify me or get an access token to, to be able to read content that's private, it's going to request certain types of scopes. Uh, if you want to see a really good list of, um, very thorough list of scopes, go to the Facebook API documentation. They have probably the most extensive list of scopes possible. It's pretty, it gets pretty granular. Um, they do things like, I want to be able to see my friends' birthdays or my friends of friends' birthdays or, um, Relationship status is different from birthday access, and and they've done that because people don't want to just give all apps blanket access to their Facebook account. So let's extend that out of the internet into the real world. So that's um, I'm happy to go. I think I have a couple more minutes, so I'm happy to answer questions about this stuff. Um, but I do want to also give you a quick list of um, other ways you can hear and learn about this thing. So um, anywebcamp.com/events is the events calendar for any webcam, and there's something going on all the time. Um, this week, uh, Amber's giving a talk tomorrow, um, tomorrow morning, as, as a sort of uh, intro to the indie web. Um, we're having a breakfast before any web camp on Thursday morning. That'll be over at Tilt, and this will be up on the website shortly too. And then um, any web camp pre-parties on Friday for happy hour uh, downtown at Pints. And then any web camp Portland is the main event. Um, this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and we're actually doing it jointly with um, New York and Berlin at the same time, synchronized. So it'll be kind of fun. We'll have video links between all the different sites and try to synchronize the schedule as much as possible. Um, yeah, so a few more, a few more links. Um, IndieAuth.com if you want to read some of the docs, and um, the Indie Web Camp Wiki is a great resource for this. So thanks, everybody. And yeah, um, feel free to leave. I think it's five minutes until the break, but I'm happy to answer questions for anybody who wants to stick around. Yeah, in the back. Right. So, so, sure. So the question was, um, this, I said this is like a lot too, but without registration, you can't have a shared secret. Um, yeah, so that's true. So turns out in OAuth 2, you also can't have a shared secret on mobile apps because you can't really bake in a secret key and have it actually be secret because people can decompile apps. There was a really good example of this um, just last week, I think, where someone decompiled the top 20 apps in the app store and you can go and find the LinkedIn secret and the you know LinkedIn app secret and all these official apps. And um, so because of that, you have to have a way to do this without a shared secret. Because even when you can register it, you can't use it in mobile apps. Um, the, way that, the way that this is, it sort of gets around that is by registering redirect URIs. So if you say my app is um, quill.p3k.io, that website points to one or more redirect URIs so that as uh, a consumer, you can query that, find the list of accepted valid ones, and you would never redirect anywhere except there. And that way, um, you, you can be certain that you're not sending people to an attacker's site. So that's, that's how it gets around that. Yeah, it's kind of like a session ID. Um, 
so the, so the questions about uh, what is the access token is a similar to session ID. Um, they're, yeah, pretty much equivalent. So the token endpoint is responsible for basically issuing a session, if you want to think of it that way, where it says, yes, here is, the, here is a token, a string that you can use so that when you come back and make a request, the request will be granted. Yeah, and there's a number of ways to implement on the back end, and, so, and there's information about that on the page too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the questions about questions about adoption and, and um, open ID being complex was a problem, but this is requiring people to actually have their own website. And um, yeah, that's that's true. There's um, a lot of the the work we're doing with Indie Web Camp is based on the assumption that people do have a website. The hope is that it will be easier for people to do so in the future, and um, it will be there will be better tools, better services to help people understand why they should have a website, how people actually do it. Um, funny enough, yesterday Google announced they're going to start being a domain registrar, which is pretty cool because they're going to do a good job of it and they're going to make it super easy to register domains, which is a lot better than like GoDaddy's interface where they try to sell you everything as you're checking out. So yeah, that's an assumption, but it's something that working towards basically. Yeah, um, HTTPS is required for this because you don't have the benefit of being able to do crypto on the client side, um, which, yeah, it, it is another um, level of complexity, but um, it is also getting easier to do that. So uh, we have SNI for sharing SSL search on the same IP address now, which was pre previously a pretty big barrier. Um, SSL certs are getting cheaper because people are, the companies are more willing to dish them out for less money because it was pretty much just an artificial market anyway. Um, so you can get uh, like an $8 SSL cert from um, Namecheap, $8 a year. There's startssl.com, which gives them out for free. Um, and yeah, that is, a, that is definitely a requirement for this to be secure. But again, it's like, it's well-established standard. Let's use it and hope that the tools become better for managing that as well. Um, also, I wanted to point out on the Indie Webcam Wiki, there's um, a page that lists out uh, generations, indiewebcam.com slash generations, which talks about that sort of, it addresses the adoption question where, um, yeah, like, this is not going to be used by everybody tomorrow, and that's okay. So, like, how do we get there step by step? Yeah. Well, great. Thanks a bunch.